Amanda, welcome to Stories in AI. How are you? Doing well, Ganesh. How are you? Doing fantastic and can't complain. The world is beautiful. Everything is going wrong, but still we have AI to save us. <laughs> so I'm so glad you uh, took the time to actually be on the show. Uh, as you know, the show is all about you know, spreading the word about what AI can do, what are the best practices, how it's being deployed, what are the impact and considerations that you'd have to help others who are also in the same journey. So why don't we start with your personal story, man? I mean, you've, you've done so much, you know, started in healthcare and got into defense and AI. And so give me the whole story. What is your personal story? Sure. Um, so I, I'm originally from Northeast Ohio, a very small town, um, but left to go to the college in New England. Um, actually got my master's degree in biomedical engineering. So that was the, the start in healthcare that you talked about. And my research for my master's degree was on medical imaging technology. So specifically uh, using retinal imagery to do early detection of diabetic retinopathy which is a, a disease that can cause, cause blindness in diabetics. I'm very familiar with that use case, by the way, and I'll tell you about it after the call. But... Okay, sounds good. Um, so I, I actually started my PhD in biomedical engineering as well, but I was getting a little bit burned out as happens when you're going straight through uh, grad school for many, many years and uh, kind of wanted to change. So I was having a conversation with the head of the human factors engineering department at Wright State University, where I was getting my PhD. And he invited me to join his lab. So that's how I got my start in human factors. It was uh, kind of organic. Um, but I was looking for my dissertation topic. I was at a happy hour with uh, my boyfriend and, and his colleagues. Um, he's now my husband. But his boss uh, was telling me about a, a data collection that they were doing. They were using infrared and visible and LADAR sensors to collect images of, of um, obscured military targets. And they could be obscured by things like trees or naturally occurring phenomenon. And they were also obscuring them with manually introduced clutter. So they're taking these difficult images and they said, we need something to, to do with these, some way to process them. So that's what I took on as my dissertation topic. It was developing algorithms to fuse the imagery from all of these different types of sensors and then using cognitive principles. And the hypothesis was that this could help pilots in high stress situations more easily identify those obscured targets by, by using the different um, imagery and fusing it together. So that was my first real exposure to AI. I considered using neural networks in my image fusion algorithms, but I ultimately rejected that method because the technology just wasn't mature enough when I was um, considering this. This was back in the early 2000s, almost 20 years ago. Um, it would probably be a different story if I were to do this today. But when you're um, in a high stress situation like that, neural networks are also dangerous. You can't really explain what's happening underneath. Right. So what did you yeah. end up using there? It was a k-means clustering algorithm. Um, so easily explainable. Um, you knew exactly what was being used to seed the clusters. Um, and and it, it wound up working pretty well to, to help the pilots identify the images as we were putting them um, in a flight simulator and having them get shot down um, by enemy aircraft. So it was a lot of fun. Um, and that led directly to my job at Northrop Grumman. So started out in inter internal research and development or what we call IRAD. So I was looking at ways to process imagery to identify what's going on in a situation. So it was a lot of Kalman filters, a lot of photogrammetry, um, but very little true artificial intelligence at that time. Um, at least not as we would think of it today. Again, this was almost 20 years ago. Um, and that was also the last time I did any real coding was in that first job at, at Northrop Grumman, because shortly thereafter, I started working more on systems engineering. Um, so bringing together um, all different disciplines to uh, make sure that these large scale systems that we often build at Northrop Grumman work together. And I was leveraging my background in cognitive engineering, um, in human factors and user experience to be able to do that. So that was my primary focus until about two years ago, um, was on the, the human factors and the user experience, working with users to understand their needs in the systems we were building and then designing and building the systems and the software and the tools to meet those needs. Um, so. That was uh, most of my career up until a few years ago. I was named a technical fellow about seven years ago. 
Um, and that was because of the work that I was doing in defining user experience and human factors policy and practice um, to, as part of the systems engineering discipline. Um, so that brought me up to about 2020, right before COVID turned everything upside down. And I was approached with the opportunity to take on the role of workforce development lead for a corporate artificial intelligence campaign. Um, so in that role, I was responsible for understanding current and future needs, training, recruitment, retention of our artificial intelligence workforce. And it, it was a very natural progression from the work I was doing in human factors and user experience and systems engineering. So it was about understanding what the requirements are around AI, what they are now, what they will be in the future, and what do we need to build in our workforce in order to meet those requirements. Um, so that was my role until about a year ago. Actually, it still is part of my job, but um, about a year ago, I also started leading our Responsible AI initiative. And I saw this role as a kind of perfect culmination of my background in user experience and human machine teaming and in building systems and software that work for our users and for people, because that is critically important in AI. As, as we've talked about in the past, you know, building trust in artificial intelligence and building systems that work with people, with people um, as part of the loop or as the loop themselves is incredibly important. So now I'm back to, to defining how we build AI tools that work for people um, and making sure that we do it in a responsible and ethical way. That's that's a fascinating background, Amanda. And a lot of things that you know I, I wanna pick and go into different directions there, but one, uh, very interesting and people don't realize this, like most good data science oriented professionals are not necessarily have a strong, long background in coding or software mm -hmm. development, right? And which actually, you know, if you, if you project it out, I believe fundamentally data science is gonna be a no code profession because it's all about problem solving. It's actually another thing you said, systems engineering. It's about trying to understand the interdependencies and workings of how a coordinated system works across multiple things. The other thing you mentioned, which is pretty awesome, that your background in human factors and the whole human experience, I mean, that is the crux of it all, right? When, you know, we, we, I, I, I don't, I can't recall who it was that I was a guest, I was having a conversation. I think it was Valeria at PwC. And we were talking about how, you know, we, we associate the, uh, we, we humanize uh, the interactions that we have with machines or intelligent systems, right? And part of that is the way the human psyche behaves when you see signs of intelligence, because it kind of makes it, you know, feel the connection and stuff. But there are so much nuanced things in how you design products and experiences that, you know, humans with regular cognitive intelligence is working with artificial intelligence. So it's that explosive speed. And in spaces that you're in right now with defense and those kind of use cases, making sure that the uh, the outcomes are not unintended, making sure the outcomes are high stakes. So you wanna ensure that the, the the right risk protocols are put in place and so forth. So I think you're right. It's the culmination of everything you've done, including the retinal, uh, uh, you know, diabetes uh, mm -hmm. uh, example that you gave early in your career. I think it's fascinating. So this session, this, this conversation, I wanna explore more on the defense side of the house, right? So, and right up your alley. Why don't you start by, you know, telling me a little bit more about what are the typical use cases? I mean, you mentioned one, right? Identifying targets in the battlefield, but I know this is, there's so many out there. So give me some, some, some broad overview of the capabilities or use cases of AI in defense today. Sure. Um, so a AI is changing the pace of warfare. Um, AI lets us do things at speed and scale that we haven't been able to do before when we were just operating with humans or with deterministic systems. So we as a defense contractor, um, an aerospace and defense company, uh, partner with the Department of Defense and with the intelligence community so that we can build and deploy and operate systems um, for national defense. and. and Almost everything that we do now and in the future is going to include AI as, as part of that. It's just, it's not optional at this point. It's something that we must do. So um, you know, a couple of the, the things that we're doing currently um, is using AI and advanced uh, and specialized processing at the tactical edge. So what that means, it's, it's a little different in defense versus commercial applications where you can have a giant data center with uh, racks and racks of equipment um, off somewhere um, in, in a 
uh, a data pipeline that gets to it and brings data back. Most of the time when we're operating in a, a warfare environment, that's not an option that we have. So we have to be able to do our AI processing at that tactical yeah, edge. You know, and, and you know, my background, I, I spent about um, 11 years at Dell and one of our, uh, we had this rugged units, which is basically put on back of a Hummer and then send it out in the battlefield or like, you know, it was just like fascinating how you can pack a small mini data center. And now the, the compactness is much more. So I totally get that, that view of how do you do, how do you use AI in the tactical edge? Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And, um, the, there is an initiative right now called JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control, that is looking at um, bridging technologies across, you know, it used to be stovepiped types of operations. Um, so being able to operate at the tactical edge is critically important for an initiative like JADC2. Um, I mentioned speed and scale. That's also something that we are um, incredibly interested in in defense use cases. Um, and being able to do speed and scale plus operating at the tactical edge is um, difficult and challenging and something that uh, defense companies like ours is very good at. Uh, that's something that we do all the time. Um, so advancing the, tech, the hardware and the software and the processing technologies to be able to do that. Um, automated processing across platforms. Um, so with JADC2, we're talking about you know, bringing together Army, Air Force, um, Navy, Marines. We also look at the different mission spaces in which we need to operate. So going from undersea to ground to air to space and in cyberspace. Um, so, you know, operating horizontally and vertically across all of those different mission spaces and being able to do so at speed and scale um, are some of the things that we're working on. Um, and I think it's it's a lot of fun working at a company that is so large and is working across all of these different areas because I certainly never get bored. Um, you know, I'm I'm always constantly learning new mission spaces. Earlier this year, I was working with an undersea team on using AI for identification of underwater sonar imagery that was, you know, something I had never seen before and a really interesting application of AI for undersea. Um, I spent three years working on space applications and then, you know, we've got everything in between. So um, there's no shortage of, right. of uh, potential use cases. I can imagine. And I, I think you, 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 uh... The, at the strategic level, you mentioned the pace and the, the speed and the pace of warfare is completely changing. I think the warfare is also, and I'm sure you'll agree to this, like the warfare is also moving from just on the battlefield to the battlefield is now coming to our everyday life. And I remember what NGC, I think it was a statement you made saying AI is the future of the defense, right? Can you explore that a little bit more? Why is why is the Department of Defense, why is the US government, why is everybody caring about AI in everyday life outside of just the battlefield? Um, so coming from a, a UX and human factors background, I have worked in situations where I have come into a project because a previous program had failed specifically because they had developed a system that used some kind of automation, not even necessarily AI, but just some sort of automation. They put it in front of the operators. The operator said, I don't understand why these decisions are being made. I don't trust the results. And they would get up and walk out and say, I'm not using this thing. Doesn't matter that we just spent millions of dollars to create it. Give me something that, that I can trust. So trust is critically important when we're building AI systems, not only because you know, we, we need to enable our human decision makers to, to continue to be responsible for the development of AI and the decisions being made as a result, that is critically important. Also though, because if we don't build that trust, the system simply won't be used. So when we, we talk about, you know, why the DOD cares about what's being developed in, in everyday life, understanding what makes human beings trust AI is something that is universally important, not just within the DOD, but also within the commercial space. So, you know, that's an area where we can, you know, draw from lessons learned in the commercial world and get a better understanding of, of what helps people understand. Um, 
the Department of Defense, and um, there was uh, a report that came out earlier this year from the National Security Commission on AI, has stated that the US must have an AI-enabled force by 2025. So we, we have to kind of draw from you know, all, all areas, from industry, from academia, from the commercial world, to better understand how we can enable the, the rapid adoption of AI because it's it's simply not an option. Um, our adversaries are doing this. So, you know, China has put incredible investment in, into AI. Um, and if we want to maintain our technological leadership relative to China, we have to advance our capabilities um, in, in this area to make sure that we can stay apace with them. Got it. So where is the current AI arms race today in that, on that regard to your point? I remember reading uh, Kai-Fu Lee's AI Superpowers book a few years ago and uh, how incredibly it touched upon a very interesting, I don't know, you know, it was a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, clickbait in the book all over, but there was definitely a, an aspect that he had actually talked about how the cultural differences in how entrepreneurship is done in that country made a huge difference in the way they approached some of these core things. Like, you know, if you start a web product in China and somewhere in Beijing, and there's chances is your competitor across the street is going to copy it, put it out there, just change the logo and launch it the next day, right? And it was okay, right? In the US, you'll get into a, a lawsuit mess and people don't do it. It's all mission driven and all things like that. Well, that created a really hustling culture to develop and that translated into research and funding and the government really looking at it and so forth. So China, for sure, and then Russia has got some, their own cybersecurity uh, centers of excellence, if you will, right? Uh, so where are we, where, how does the U.S. stack up in the arms race today? And what do you see as the opportunity slash threats? Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges around that, and, and I'm I'm not going to answer the question of where we are relative to Russia and China, because that, that'll get me into trouble very quickly. But I, I will say that, um, it, it's something that we absolutely need to pay attention to. Both China and Russia are pushing for global power in AI, and China has stated that it will be the global leader in AI by 2030. And they are investing tremendous amounts of money um, to support that claim. So this is a huge push. Um, so they also play by different rules than we do in terms of privacy. Um, it, China uses AI for surveillance and tracking of its citizens, um, of people who visit the country. Um, they monitor online behavior, social interactions, biometrics. We don't do that. Um, we have laws that prevent us from that. And, and we want to maintain those laws and we want to develop AI in line with our democratic values. So that is a constraint that we have put on ourselves. Um, but doesn't change the fact that, that China does not have that constraint. So um, we, it's a, a push for us even harder to work together with our allies to develop AI in line with our democratic values and to establish um, regulations and policies around how AI is developed and used to ensure that we stay true to those values. Um, got it. I think, you know, it's interesting and I want to touch upon the ethics a little later, but, you know, it's it's fascinating you mentioned this and I'm trying to connect it back to something else you said about the, the human trust factor, right? The human interactions. What I think and I want everybody listening to understand is AI is um, a, a, an orders of magnitude uh, able technology that has ever been developed by mankind so far, right? It's going to completely has the potential to change the way we live socialize, we interact and we, we govern and all, all sorts of things. And so the, the interest in making AI a centerpiece of how we think about defense is more than just tactical use cases in the field versus, you know, in everyday life. It's about the way that, you know, you can now, uh, you people think and talk about AGI, artificial general intelligence, but think about something like a social network like Facebook, right? And how we have, you know, unfortunately, the investigation is still going on, but you know, it's been very proven, the Cambridge Analytica story and so forth. It is basically a cybernetic system that can be used to manipulate people's behavior, which is a larger threat than uh, a nuclear bomb flying across the, uh, you know, the, the, the sky and landing on my backyard, right? I mean, it's a much bigger threat. And those will be done in a way that, you know, will be so subtle that it'll just change the landscape of your society, the fabric of your society and disrupt life 
and people do it. Like the power uh, outage that we saw in the, the the hack into the power systems, you know, by Russian sponsors. So all of these things is why, uh, you know, everybody listening and should understand that this is such a big theme for defense and the DOD and the national government. To your point on, um, you know, the, the the ethics and how we approach it and what our focus is as the uh, uh, as the United States government, and how we think about it versus our allies think about it. It's actually a very noble thing to actually, in the in the face of adversity, in the face of this bit, uh, unbalanced battle space, right? You still want to do the right thing by embracing our democratic values and doing it. so. Explore that a little bit for me in terms of, you know, one of the things I always talk about in in um, uh, in ethics is ethics is a very um, personal concept like you tr- touched upon right it's like everybody it's is it my ethics you know is it other people's ethics is it like so you know one of our allies saudi arabia for example have slightly different views on women's rights for example right or uh you know everything is changing we're all trying to influence our allies and stuff i know this kind of gets into foreign policy a little bit but uh, leave that aside but my question is how do you create a common code of ethics for evaluating systems uh that are semi-automated or fully automated decision systems or artificial intelligence. And how do you use a framework like that to go, you know, to, to manage this better? Explore that a little bit for me. Sure. So, so yes, I I think uh, having a framework is important. uh, Something that we can point to and say that these are the ethical principles by which I'm operating and, and building and, um, and developing. So for us right now, the uh, we're looking towards the Department of Defense. Um, and it was in 2019, I believe, the Defense Innovation Board first set out five ethical principles of artificial intelligence. Um, and then the DOD formally adopted those last year, and they are being implemented by the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center at the Pentagon. So those five prin- principles are responsible, equitable, traceable, reliable, and governable. Um, Responsible means that human beings must maintain responsibility for the development and use of AI, which is very near and dear to my heart as a UX and human factors professional. Um, Second is equitable. So that means we need to account for bias, reduce bias through testing, through making sure that we have the right training data that we're using to train our algorithms and through diverse engineering teams. It's actually been proven that one of the best ways to identify potential bias in your training set is by having a diverse team uh, looking at that data. Um, So that's the first two principles. Third principle is traceable. Um, So that means that we need to ensure that our systems are auditable, that we know where the data is coming from, where it's going, and um, who is developing the algorithms at each step of the way. Fourth is reliable. So that means that our systems need to do what they say they're going to do. They need to operate within the use cases that we, we say they're going to operate in. Um, And this is particularly important within the DOD because our systems are constantly subject to adversarial attack. Um, So, you know, we're we're not operating in a vacuum here. We have people who are trying to bring our systems down. Um, And the final principle is governable. Um, So that means that if something does go wrong, if you know we're operating outside of our intended use cases, that we have graceful termination, that humans can take over if we need them to. Um, and if the algorithms aren't doing what we want them to do, we can bring them offline. Um, so those were the five principles. They were put out last year. We're currently working to understand how we operationalize those. Um, and at Northrop Grumman, we've been taking a look at that over the last year, developing our own internal policies and procedures and, and auditability around the, those five ethical principles. Um, And and all of this is so that we can build that trust that we were talking about earlier. Um, You know, the the National Security Commission on AI report has an entire chapter on justified confidence. So that just goes to show you just how important that is um, in order to make sure that we're building AI systems that are robust, reliable, um, that are accountable, that we make sure that we can verify and validate that we are building the systems that we say we're, we're going to in line with those ethical principles. Um, and there's a, a quote from that report that I absolutely love because it, it goes to exactly what I was saying earlier, that if our AI systems don't work as designed or if they're unpredictable, if they're doing things that we don't expect them to do, 
say leaders will not adopt them, operators will not use them, Congress will not fund them, and the American people will not support them. So we, we, we do ethics, you know, develop things in line with ethical principles because it's a good idea, because we're all human beings who want our, our systems to operate as they should. But ultimately, if we don't do this, they're not going to be used. Um, and, and that would be, uh, you know, disastrous. That's just that's unacceptable. Yeah, it's disastrous. Of resources. And no, it's, and, and uh, I love that concept of justifiable confidence. I think, uh, you know, should, I, it should be a, an everyday term beyond just AI, to be honest, right? So to, to, to really ask the question, why are you doing something you're doing? And can you justify that you're doing it the right way? Um, yep. You know, one of the things that I wondered, and ethics and trust, I mean, these things are really complex topics. And you know, it's, it's, as much or more of human psychology than it is of systems and technology, right? Um, but one of the things like, you know, uh, it's important, especially working at the national stage and working with the governments, the DODs and stuff, beyond just technology, the policy landscape, as well as the, uh, the industry participation, the academic participation and so forth, has to all keep up. Right, because innovation is going to come from all those different places. Can you talk a little bit? I know NGC is doing a lot of things in that space, but can you talk a little bit about how the the the, the U.S. defense landscape is actually leveraging all of this and and trying to bring industry, academy, and the uh, national interest forward together? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I'm so impressed with what the government has been doing in in this area and bringing together all the relevant stakeholders. I attended the the last National Security Commission on AI workshop that had leaders from around the world, um, in some cases, prime ministers of countries talking about just how important it is that we have a common foundation for AI ethical principles. So I'm, I'm so encouraged by that. Um, at Northrop Grumman specifically, we are we're definitely taking that call to action to heart, working across government, industry, and academia. Um, we have partners in the technology sector um, in Silicon Valley and with large uh, corporations that we're partnering with. Um, we have partners partnerships with academia like uh, Carnegie Mellon University and the Software Engineering Institute. We have a very strong partnership with. Um, we've participated with the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center's Tradewind organization. Um, so I, I really see, especially the, the Jake, if you go to AI.mil um, and, and take a look around there for everybody who's watching this, it, it's really impressive the amount of um, outreach that the DOD has been doing, not just with traditional defense contractors like Northrop Grumman, but with uh, across industry and academia to try to get the best practices around the operationalization of AI um, and, and the ethical concerns and making sure that we're adequately addressing those. So I've, I've been incredibly impressed with how quickly the government is moving in this area. That is awesome, Amanda. And, you know, I, I have some... Uh... So my last startup that I founded, co-founded, uh, we did a lot of work with the Air Force. And it was, we were in the space of, um, uh, da it, it, it's, it's an ML feature store now where we started as a data virtualization platform, just allowing, you know, different silos of data to be brought together to make decisions. So, and, and that's when I first personally got engaged with the DOD through the SBIR, SB, SBT, SDTR programs. And I'd been pretty impressed. And since then, two of my other portfolio companies one is in the space, they're working with Air Force, uh, it's called Sky Schedule. They do a lot of work in operations, disaster management, and operational uh, uh, um, operational AI, if you will, right? So how do you actually optimize operations using deep learning? And they do a lot of work with the Air Force right now for their planning, the training things and stuff. They were also a recipient of the phase two, phase three award of the um, uh, of the DOD. So no, it's, it's pretty impressive. But one thing I always wonder, are they still moving fast enough, right? I mean, is this fast enough? Because one is in comparison to adversaries like China, right? That's leave that aside, but just look at the pace at which we can actually do, do what we do in the industry, right? And here I agree. It's more like you're, you're constrained with policy, policymakers, ensuring that people who really cannot spell artificial intelligence are brought up to speed on what AI is and what it could do, which is good because it forces you to really think, but are you losing out on speed against the adversaries, against the industry, against what we should be doing? 
I don't think so. I think we're doing a good job as an industry, as a nation. Um, like you said, it's it's really important that we move quickly. The technology is moving quickly. It's developing rapidly. But we also need to be very careful that we don't move too fast and set up all these regulations that could potentially stifle innovation or not be reasonably enforced. Um, because it is important that we keep the technology develop, move, development moving. So I, I think we're having the right conversations at the right time. Um, the government is, is setting up you know, uh, institutions. They're, they're currently standing up the National AI Advisory Committee. Um, the, this administration has made this part of the, the budget. So I, I think we're doing the right thing as long as we keep up. So, you know, we can't slow down because that pace of technology innovation is going to keep going. So we have to keep pace with that. But I think we're moving at the speed that we should be at this point. That is awesome. I'm, I'm sure hoping that we are because uh, it's incredibly important. We all know that's why we're in this space. This is one of the most profound pieces of technology that we have at our disposal. Um, interestingly enough, you know, one thing I would say is like, you know, even though uh, from a, from a pace perspective and how you're actually doing this, the industry is the the regular industry, the private industry, not with the government are, you know, trying to move at breakneck speed, but there is enough learnings that they can take from the defense community and how you develop AI systems with the frameworks in place that they can use to make sure they're building better products than just better mousetraps, right? So do you have any pieces of recommendations or, you know, guidance to say, hey, if you're doing, if you're developing AI systems for your own private purpose, if you're an organization doing it for your customers, for your internal employees, what are some of the things they should be thinking of? Lessons you can learn from working in the defense space. Um, know, know your customers and what their needs are. Um, I, I think that's something that we do pretty well in defense. You know, many of us um, are are tightly uh, integrated with the military in one way or another. We have a lot of former military who work for us. My husband's an active duty Air Force officer. So, um, you know, for many of us, it's very personal and we're very tightly connected to the mission. I think that's something that, um, you know, the, com the commercial world could could do very well in understanding what their users' needs are. Um, and that doesn't mean necessarily what they say they are, um, but you know, kind of looking toward the future and getting that deep understanding of, of their customers and their users and how they will operate their AI systems, how they will feel about them, um, you know, what, what are their fears around artificial intelligence? Because there is a lot of fear out there. Um, around AI and how will you counteract those fears and get them comfortable with with using their systems and build trust in the AI that we're developing? Got it. Got it. Uh, what is what according to you are some of the most critical pieces of work that are happening or yet to happen? Right. Things that you know. And then another variant of that question is, what problems are still unsolved that you want the innovator community to start solving? Yeah, so my answer is going to be biased, um, you know, based on my own background, but it's it's bias. Um, so I work around uh, understanding and counteracting data bias, algorithmic bias. Um, this is a persistent problem in AI. You are never going to get rid of bias completely, nor should you. In some cases, bias is actually helpful. Um, but we have to continue to work to understand the sources of bias in our data sets and in our algorithms and, and to counteract unintended bias. Um, so I think there's a lot of great work going on in this area um, around identifying the sources of potential bias and around mitigating those. And I, I think this is it's incredibly important in the commercial world. And you know, there's a lot of um, you know, great resources. There's an incredible Netflix documentary called Coded Bias that talks about this. Um, if you haven't watched it, go, go see it. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, but this is particularly important within DOD as well, because we not only have the bias that's inherently present in our data sets, but we can also have bias that's introduced maliciously. Um, by adversaries. So continuously working to understand the bias, even if we've you know, counteracted it within our development process, once we're in operations, you know, we have to be uh, aware of that potential for adversarially introduced bias. So I, I think work in this area is incredibly important. I think you know, I'm, I'm answering you both 
both of your questions there. I think there's a lot of great work that's been done in this area, but the landscape is forever changing, particularly within the DOD space. And when you have adversaries who are constantly working to um, find new ways to take down your systems, the, the work never ends. So it's, it's an exciting uh, area to keep working in. I, I agree. In fact, you know, but just to give uh, a little bit more color in my personal experience and bias, it's such a subjective landscape, right? You can't really, it's, there's no right or wrong answer because uh, I remember working with a, a healthcare provider four or five years ago, early days of AI, and they were using AI to predict which customers will end up being a bad debt, right? Who will not pay. And as you can imagine, based on historic data that they trained it, they figured out that, you know, when we looked at the data, there is a specific racial minority who will always come up because of the poverty concerns and how they're, you know, social, the social strata of where they, where they fit in, uh, unfortunately. And so they had a choice. I mean, how do you mitigate that? Because you're now trading off bias to accuracy of what your models can actually give, right? So the only, back to your question point on user experience, the only solvable problem we could give them was get, gave them a dial to say, do you want this uh, algorithm to be more accurate or to be more fair, right? And then they can, depending on the topic of how they're using it and what context, they can choose which one they want to do. Is it more for planning purposes and th making sure that you're looking at your treasury management and how you can manage cash? Well, you might want to go and use the more accurate outcome to go do it to identify customers, to reach out to them and have a proactive conversation or get them some nice programs to get back into, you may want to really think about introducing a, a biased situation there by further, you know, uh, it, it's just such a, such a complex topic in my experience too. So I think. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And, and that's something that um, humans can do that right now algorithms can't. Understanding the the context around where the system is operating, the socio-political considerations around the outcomes. Um, we need humans to do that because that's something that humans can do and, and AI can't. Now humans bring their own biases to the table. So we have to work to counteract those as well as part of this, you know, human AI team. Um, but it, it's something that we we have to continue to pay attention to. We can't just say, well, that's what the data tells us and that's what the algorithm tells us. So it, it must be right. We have to look at the entire context of the situation. I, I agree. I agree. I think, in fact, I'm, I've been recently pretty fascinated with all the work that's happening in graph neural networks in general, right? Where you're trying to really simulate the way, you know, the, 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 our cognitive brain works in terms of connecting things and making decisions where you can then link multiple nodes and multiple dynamic networks into the decision-making process. I mean, it's not going to get close to how humans make decisions, but it takes it a step closer so that they can then be looped into a human and say, here's a recommendation, let's go do this. Or what do you, do you agree with it or not? Right? So, Amanda, this has been fascinating. What other questions should I be asking you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, let's see. Uh, so how about where, um, if somebody wants to start a career in AI or is already working in a, a relevant area, how to you know, get up to speed on, on AI technology? Go for it. Go for All it. right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so first of all, uh, you know, we, we kind of touched on this at the beginning of our conversation. Um, AI is not just the realm of software engineers and people who can code anymore. I think data literacy and, and understanding just what AI is and what it can do is important for anybody who works in technology. Um, you know, whether that's a manager, a software engineer, a systems engineer, a business analyst, a quality assurance person, um, no matter what your role, understanding what AI is and what it can do is, is incredibly important. So um, a, a couple of resources uh, that, that I like to use, I mentioned AI.mil earlier. Um, there's a blog on, on there put out by the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center if you're specifically interested in what's going on around AI within the Department of Defense. Um, it's, it's an excellent source of information. Um, the Brookings Institute uh, puts out a number of webinars that discuss uh, AI, the technical, um, but also the societal impacts. Um, and I find those incredibly fascinating um, and a great source of information. 
Um, if you want to get more technical, there's a YouTube channel called Three Blue Run One Brown. Three Blue One Brown. Um, and it does a great job of explaining very detailed AI concepts in a very clear and understandable way. When I went back to working in AI after a long break, that's kind of where I, I went to to bring myself back up to speed. Um, and it's it's entertaining um, and 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 really a great description. Um, and then I'll, I'll also put in a plug for Carnegie Mellon University. Um, their Software Engineering Institute uh, has uh, a lot of information on AI and number of webinars that they do uh, around their AI engineering initiative that I, I think do a fantastic job of talking about what AI is, why it's important, and, and what all the implications are around how we operationalize it. You know, I, I'll just add one more to that list. Uh, there's a YouTube channel called Stories in AI where you can hear people who have practical insights and experiences working in AI systems, they can come in and maybe you should add that to your list too. They can Absolutely. More practical insights. No, man, that's been fascinating. I got some rapid fire, quick fire questions for you. Uh, you know, these are kind of fun, kind of, uh, uh, you know, about you, if you will, right? Number one is okay. artificial general intelligence, AGI. Do you believe in, in it? Do you think we'll see it in our lifetime? Do you worry about it? No, I don't. Um, I, I don't think it will uh, come to fruition in my lifetime. Um, I think we are a very, very, very long way from any kind of meaningful artificial general intelligence. Um, and I know the work that we're doing right now on ethics around regulation, around policy, and that will be fully mature a very long time before artificial general intelligence is. is so I, I think as long as we're having these conversations around AI ethics and policy and we get that in place, um, we're never going to create Skynet or Cylons or, or any of the things that we see in science fiction. That is awesome. No, thank you for that. Uh, what is one personal practice that you employ to remain at the top of your game with you attribute to your success? Um, I, I try to read every day. Um, I, I try. I don't always, um, but but when I do, you know, there's there's so much new information coming out uh, around artificial intelligence and especially around AI ethics. Um, I try every day to spend a little bit of time reading the latest articles. Um, it usually sparks some good ideas, so I'm uh, always glad when I do it. But um, I, I think that's a good practice to make sure you're continuously learning. Awesome. Amanda, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for spending the time. Do you have any questions for me? Um, I will just say thank you for having me here. I think you're doing a great thing with, with having these conversations around artificial intelligence. Um, I'm excited to be a part of it. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks for taking the time. Um, and if I could put in one more plug for a resource, if um, the listeners can go to northropgrumman.com and search for artificial intelligence and machine learning, we have a lot of great resources on our webpage as well. Awesome. And I'll also make it a point to put it in the show notes so people can go get it. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you, Ganesh.